I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'm Rick Hansen, and you probably knew. And as you may have known, uh, I spent the last month essentially on a journey uh, through the Sierra Nevada. And I was able to take the time for it and um, it, uh, in a way that's relevant to the topic and matters a lot to me, I'm going to offset the carbon I consumed uh, in the process of uh, doing this, which uh, if you don't know much about carbon offsets, obviously we need to conserve and I'll be mindful of our footprint on the planet, and yet we're part of processes that inevitably do are, are involved with carbon emissions into the sky and so forth. And there are things we can do that are really not too unreasonable, that are not too expensive actually, to offset or to balance or to compensate for um, the harms that we've done in some way, while still trying to do as few harms as possible. Anyway, so I got a chance to do um, what I've loved doing, which is being in wilderness. Uh, I have a background as a kid growing up in the tract homes of Southern California, West Covina. And uh, basically our home, when we first moved into it, had no yard or lawn or anything. It was just concrete houses and streets and dirt and laid on top of orange groves. So I, I felt alienated from nature as a kid. And I sought refuge actually in the remaining orange groves, acres and acres of orange groves, kind of a certain constructed, but still somewhat wild and mysterious foresty realm for a eight year old boy. And also the hills of Southern California that were accessible and around our home where deer were and coyotes and poison oak and <laughs> And other good things. And anyway, so for me, being in nature, being in the wilderness has always really been important to me. Uh, on the edge of the sea, looking up at the sky. And I have a background as well. I stumbled into rock climbing, which for a scrawny, nerdy, uh, young fellow of 21 or so, when I discovered it, who never had felt very good about his own body, aha, this was a kind of fun, redemptive, strong thing I could do that was pretty bold and suited my kind of tenacious go for it nature uh, and got fairly decent at it actually, climbing into my um, 30s and early 40s. Then I stopped climbing for quite some time and I'm in the middle of and toward the end of actually my 70th lap around the sun. What a long strange trip it's been. And uh, I wanted to see if I could get back into climbing. Um, and part of that was to discover whether this shoulder, I, I've had a little torn rotator cuff that's been mending, uh, was capable of it. So I, I went to, uh, on my journey, I went initially to Kings Canyon in Sequoia Park. And some of these areas might be familiar to some of you in California, USA. And then I, traveled across Sequoia to Mineral King at the end of a, re a remarkable, <laughs> challenging single lane, 22 mile or so road that takes about an hour and a half to traverse uh, with all its twists and turns. And after uh, some days there in Mineral King, I drove down uh, around the southern tip of the Sierra Nevada and um, up to the Mammoth Lakes area up through Lone Pine and Bishop heading north on the eastern side of the Sierra, where I stayed for about three weeks in a dispersed camping area uh, with my friend and guide, Roddy McCallie, uh, and went rock climbing for a number of days with him and experimented with what I could possibly do. So that's where I've been. And at one level, it was you know a very privileged, kind of vacation. Uh, many of the people I met lived out of their cars uh, on very, very little money, dedicating themselves to an outdoor life and and um, really being in the wild a lot. So I was able to do it. Um, and it turned out to be kind of as I hoped it would be, I guess, vastly more than 
you know, a nice vacation to take kind of on the eve of some kind of retirement. And I want to talk with you about it. And I want to talk with you about it in a way that feels a little um, uncommon for me in terms of how I tend to give talks. And uh, we'll sort of see how this turns out. And I want to use this as an opportunity to explore um, being nature, being nature, not apart from it, but of it, not above it, but in it. And what that actually means, what that actually means uh, besides, you know, the kind of cliches about, you know, spending a week camping or, um, you know, something that we might put on a calendar. So I felt deeply touched by my time, you know, under the trees, high up on the bones of the earth, the mountains, uh, being informed and guided by my friend Roddy, who's a, a naturalist as well as an extraordinary uh, mountaineering and outdoor guide. Uh, and um, I just clocked a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time, just trudging uphill <laughs> at 11,000 feet. Uh, clocked a lot of time moving up, uh, challenging rocks and cliffs and standing high on peaks at 12,000 feet, uh, you know, tasting the water of lakes filtered uh, and hearing the birds, seeing a bear, uh, having a frog crawl over my hand when I stuck it deep into a challenging crack and, you know, made friends with a spotted frog a couple hundred or 200 feet above the ground there. And uh, when the dust has settled, I, I really feel that there's something deep um, and relevant to Buddhist practice and to practice in general that has to do with um, reclaiming and re-inhabiting the fundamental fact of our existence, which is that we are of nature. And yet so much in our modern lives, much as the tract homes uh, of my childhood were alienated from nature, they were laid on top of it in a very suppressive and controlling and unnatural way. Uh, many of us live, me included, in ways that feel somewhat alienated from the web of life, from the earth, uh, from our kinship uh, with all other living things, even alienated from the physical flows of air and energy and water and other molecules. Moving through it, moving through us, and and as us, I want to talk about that if I could. I'm just sharing my own experiences here. Uh, I'm don't think I'm particularly good at this topic. Uh, I am speaking from my heart. Uh, there are many people who are much more experienced with this. Perhaps some of you among them. Um, in particular, in particular, uh, lately I've been more and more aware of and informed by the wisdom of the first people the indigenous wisdom of people who already know a hundred times more than I'm gonna be able to talk about right now. And among other sources, I've been really enjoying getting to know the book Braiding Sweetgrass, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I highly recommend, written by uh, someone uh, who's Native American and also a plant scientist and a poet and a beautiful writer. I invite you throughout this little talk here to consider your own relationship with nature broadly, with life. And if the root of all sickness, as some say, is homesickness, what homesickness might there be in your soul, in your bones, in your belly and body that knows in some ways you're more separated than you really need to be in fact and in consciousness. And I encourage you to you know, consider your relationship with nature as not as something that you visit, you know, as we often do, but as something you are. And you might relate to this talk, which will be relatively brief to open time for discussion, even as a kind of meditation. 
just letting letting these reflections sink in and finding finding what is true for you and useful for you. Now, ironically, to keep us alive, our our brains and bodies constructed by nature, including across three and a half or so billion years of evolutionary time, our brains and bodies are continually trying to create an apparent separation between you and the world and continually trying to stabilize inherently unstable, dynamic, and impermanent processes. We do this, the body does this to keep us alive, interestingly, in a way that contains an inherent kind of delusion in it and an inherent stressful struggle against that which is really true, which is that we are inherently connected as fluid, dynamic, ever-changing processes. That's the reality of things. We are each continuous with the world. The world flows into us, flows through us. We flow out into it. The edges are blurred and fuzzy. Yes, you could say the mountain and the tree are distinct in some ways. Completely true, completely true. And still, the tree takes the mountain into it from the soil. And the tree and the tree's companions, other trees, help to hold the mountain in place when the storms come. As Thich Nhat Hanh wrote memorably, and you may know this quotation, a cloud never dies. He wrote, when conditions are sufficient, a cloud transforms into rain, snow, or hail. The cloud has never been born and will never die. This insight of signlessness and interbeing helps us recognize that all lives continue in different forms. Nothing is created, nothing is destroyed, everything is in transformation. There is no real death because there is always a continuation. Now it's true that logicians and others might nitpick word here, word there, well, what about this? Yes, but your mind, if it's like mine, may well have been doing that already. And see if you could just kind of let it go. Let it go. And see what happens when you somehow rest in the knowing that the great late Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh pointed to, which is that everything is interconnected and in process so that there's really one single fabric of life embedded in a much vaster single fabric of reality. Now, we can relate to this. You could think, oh, wow, Rick went to the mountains. <laughs> he sniffed too many pine trees. <laughs> you know, he drank too much lake water. Uh, you know, cool slogans. Yeah, whatever. I'm, I'll send more money to the Sierra Club. You know, we can relate to us in that way. We can visit these teachings, maybe like we try to visit nature. And yet, what they are, and this is our opportunity, is that they are piercingly intimate descriptions of our original nature. What Thich Nhat Hanh is writing about is a piercingly intimate description of your original nature. And we can let it land in that way. To be whole, we wish to be whole. To be whole, to live wholly, we must include our whole selves, which extend out into the plants and insects and animals and out into the whole of life. That's what it is to be whole. And if we don't feel whole, it's because we're not living wholly in the whole of creation, we could say, right? We interbe, that's the fact. And 
there's some way in which just my time and you know enabled me to feel it really really keenly to just sit quietly under a tree to sit quietly looking out a window up at the sky you know and just sit quietly looking at a geranium on you know an apartment in an apartment building window oh whoa, whoa you really feel the the interbeingness of us all or as the profound teaching from Africa, Ubuntu, that I'm learning about and have much to learn, puts it, I am because you are. You are because I am. But this is not how most of us live this these days, is it? It's not for me. I, I haven't lived this way, particularly. I'm all for modern medicine and the internet, but even as someone with more time in wilderness than many people, still, there's been something missing in my own life. And what's been missing became sharply clear to me on this journey I recently took. So do you feel this yourself? Is there some knowing, honestly, that there's some division, some alienation, some lack of wholeness, some cutting off, some maybe, dare I say, a kind of unconsidered arrogance about humankind's presumed dominion over the natural world. Is there any of that floating around? You know, or most fundamentally, do you feel in your heart that something's been missing? You know? I think there's a knowing deep down inside when we feel divided from outside the web of life that is our true home. And that knowing if it's true for you can be a wonderful teacher and guide and medicine and, and compass because it points us toward the correcting, the correction, the coming home that we need. Now, in this knowing of something missing for you can be a, a kind of mourning for the loss of something we never knew we had even in the background. You know, when it's no longer there in front of you, over time you can forget it was ever there. But somehow, somehow, um, you know something is missing. For example, when I drove through Sequoia Park, first I drove through, you know, miles of probably square miles of burnt forest. Um, the result of many factors certainly among them, is um, human-made human climate change, among the factors. And then I came up down into the Central Valley of California, which was um, baking in the heat, uh, dusty, um, filled with smoke, filled with oil well, oil rigs, pumping and pumping and pumping, filled with cars, including my own, there were belching smoke of various kinds. Um, vast sweeps of industrialized agriculture, monoculture, lots of pesticides. It was kind of shocking. And then a little later, uh, my friend Roddy just let me know that what John Muir had seen and wrote about, I think in the 1870s maybe, um, when he gazed out over the Central Valley, was just a vast and verdant green plain teeming with life. Huge herds of elk and other things, uh, flocks of birds that would darken the sky, moist, lush wetlands, uh, fertile ground. And then we see what there is today. You know, you can feel the, the sorrow of that. Um, alongside the longing to feel whole, by being in the whole, the whole living, breathing fabric of life, alongside that longing can be a grieving for what humanity is doing to our precious planet. I learned a term, eco-melancholia, eco-melancholia. You know, the sorrow and the outrage at the climate crisis and mass species extinctions and the knowing, the knowing, the helpless knowing even, 
that so much that is torn apart and lost each day will never, can never be mended or restored. Irrevocable damage and harm. And yet, and yet, and yet still, life goes on in its ways, despite our delusions of separation. It is not too late, it is never too late to come home in our own life and inhabit the living and the nature that is already our ground, our true home. It's never too late, how about right now? Never too late to take a single breath and feel your vulnerable intimacy with air as it comes in to the moist, tender tissues of your lungs. Intimacy, vulnerable intimacy with air and the gifts of oxygen in it from many green growing things. Never too late to take a breath. Receiving all those little atoms, dependent and letting yourself be dependent on all those little gifts. And then sharing your own gifts as you exhale carbon dioxide, offering those gifts back to plants around the world. It's simply a breath. We feel our embeddedness in living. Yeah. We are nature already, inescapably. Um, one of the teachings that came to me on this journey was basically, you know, recognize <laughs> that you already belong, you know, and act like you already belong and you're part of it and, and you're a gift into nature and you receive the gifts of nature in one single circular process. Uh, our work is not to try to finally be nature, but to rather to recognize what's already true, that we are nature and surrender to it. What might it be like to surrender to nature? And I think find in that submission, submission to what is true, to find in that submission tremendous peacefulness and joy somehow. So what might this look like concretely for you? In real terms, whatever has been meaningful for you and what you have felt or intuited or known and what I'm talking about here, whatever you've been honest about, you know, longing for and, and you know, taking a breath and maybe wanting to bring in a little course correction, uh, including just in what you're aware of in your own life, what might this look like concretely for you? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer a few things that are real for me. Uh, for one, uh, my friend and guide Roddy, Roddy McCallie, asked if I knew the names of the 20 or so birds and trees in my neighborhood, in my backyard, my front yard. I live in San Rafael on the edge of open space uh, in Terra Linda. Um, and I was like, uh, <laughs> I think there's some quail <laughs> and there's some pine trees, I think, and, you know, some oaks, oaks, right? <laughs> You know, scrambling, you know, some hummingbirds. <laughs> and he just looked at me and smiled. And and for him, it was not an academic exercise. You know, he has a bachelor's in uh, biology. You know, and uh, he was a, f you know, outdoor educator for quite a while. No, it's about neighborliness. Do you know the names of your friends? Yeah, I do, actually. I'd be embarrassed not to. I might have to struggle as my aging brain to pull up a word once in a while, but Oh, I know the names of my friends. Well, what about the friends in your yard, your your neighbors? You live among. They live with you. They live. They are because you are, because you have planted things in your place of being, because you have a little bird feeder, you know, because you have a, you know, a little pond. The hummingbirds like swim, you know, flying above the pond where the little bugs are at night. Um, you know, what are the names of them? Are you willing to invest? As I promised, Roddy, I would in learning the names of the trees or the birds or the other creatures in your neighborhood as a neighborliness. That's something, maybe. Another, when you sit down to eat, uh, perhaps 
Can you take a few moments to consider where that tomato or juice or piece of meat came from? I do this meditation sometimes. I'll just reflect on the tomato and the bear, some of the many causes and conditions that led it to, to be there uh, on my plate. Can you be aware even of the kind of the elements in it, the primordial elements of earth and water, fire and air that have flowed through those foods into your own body and then out through you, out into the world? We are each standing waves. As the philosopher, wonderful being, Evan Thompson talks about it, we are standing streaming, standing streaming. Continuous processes that have a certain stability while being, of course, um, dependently arising and dynamic. That's a reflection in a meal. Oh, perhaps with a thank you. Can you find time to cherish something in nature? You know, some plant or creature you tend, perhaps something wild and untamed even. Perhaps a simple blessing, even. Some simple metta, loving kindness, for an ant on the sidewalk, or a pigeon cooing up on a power pole. One time I was climbing in El Dorado Canyon in Boulder, Colorado, above Boulder, Colorado, and I was pretty decent as a climber then, and we were completing a quite a technical and difficult uh, Colorado 510 back in the 1980s, not an easy thing, and we're, you know, almost done with our climb, uh, myself and two friends. And I'm standing there on the final belay, about a foot and a half wide, about a foot deep, attached to a bolt and feeling pretty spicy. You know, oh, I got up here already pretty well. And then I looked in front of me and there was a big black ant crawling on the cliff, pulling over crystals of quartz, you know, moving around, completely comfortable. Definitely its equivalent of what it was climbing was much harder at scale to its body than what I had been doing. And I was humbled. I was stunned. And I knew enough to wonder a little bit, how in the world does the nervous system, the little brain of that ant, do all that in a way that the best scientists at Caltech or MIT just could not create a robot to do? Like, wow. you know. So can you find a blessing maybe for an ant or a butterfly or uh, a weed? or what we call a weed. Can you look up at the sky and down at the ground and remember that you are in the world? That was one of the big ones for me, in the world. Not looking at it, separated from it or visiting it, but actually of it. Can you do that? Can you feel that you're of the world, made by the world, and eventually knowing that all of your atoms will be released back into the world? That's a practice too. Can you take a little time each day, if you like, and a lot of time occasionally when you can? And I had the privilege and to some extent the earned capability of being able to do this myself, but in your own way, in whatever setting you're in. Can you take some time to sit amidst whatever is nature for you? And for me, that's as simple as sitting where I can see a tree and the sky. Hotels in New York, looking out the window, I see a tree, I see the sky. Can you do that? And then let the wild preciousness of life, to paraphrase the poet Mary Oliver, can you let the wild preciousness of life seep into you? Being lived by life lived by nature. And can you know as well that you too are precious life, not apart from all the preciousness of life. You are a large land mammal <laughs> with your own place in the natural world, of and in and as the natural world, not apart from it, in a single atom or a single breath. Most broadly, as it is real for you, can you feel the edges softening in your body and mind 
and feel and maybe know, maybe know, even for just a flash, that you are woven into the single fabric of reality. One fabric with many patterns, many mountains and valleys, many trees and bears and birds, many people and many stories, and still all one single tissue that you and I and all of us are. Let's just sit quietly for a couple minutes and then we can explore this together. Well, thank you for going on a little journey with me. (laughs) Perhaps a slightly uncharacteristic one uh, for me. And as we explore this together um, till half past the hour or so, um, I really encourage you to, you know, with me, keep helping this be experiential. I mean, I used words and abstractions as best I could. And to keep coming back to what's important for you in this? What's important for you in how you today and tomorrow and all the tomorrows to come, how you be, how you practice, what you take into account. Tanisi Coates, the great writer and activist, um, wrote once, I believe, that privilege means not having to take something into account. And there's so much that our well-upholstered lives can enable us to not take into account. And in a, in a deep way, what I'm really pointing to tonight as best I can is returning to taking nature and life fully into account in your own in your own life in effect and what does that mean to you what little what little doable things in the midst of your ordinary life would be meaningful and helpful to you from what we're talking about tonight anybody want to have a anybody have a question not a comment but a question related to what we've talked about tonight um, you could put, raise your hand. Oh, okay. I see. That's why I don't see you. I have to go back to the first Zoom window. Let's just see. Yeah, it's the opposite of feeling lonely. That's beautiful. Great. Um, great. Lovely comments. Okay, great. So I see Tom, you have a question and then Lynn. So Tom, is your hand up? So yeah. Great. Tom's one of our stewards and a good buddy. Thank you, Rick. Welcome back. Yeah. Uh, what came to mind, I don't have a question, but a thought. Uh, years ago, I read a motivational speaker 
uh, by the name of Og Mandino, and he talked about the idea of acres of diamonds in our own backyard. Hmm. And your talk tonight really has inspired me to look in my own backyard. Beautiful. And what's in my backyard is about a half a mile away. I have a redwood preserve called Roy's Redwoods. And um, after our talk tonight, I'm going to take a run because I'm training for a race and uh, take my dog and run over to Roy's Redwoods and experience it. Yeah. So thank you for your motivation. We okay. do have, I think we do all have these acres of diamonds in our own backyard. Yeah. And even as Roddy the naturalist, to build on your what you said about your backyard, he, he'll take you know kids out or used to and just look at a square foot of dirt and just observe a square foot of dirt for 10 minutes. And suddenly you realize it's a, it's a world in there for all the little creatures moving around, the, the stuff they're engaged with. You know, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of it. Uh, great. Okay, thank you. All right, Lynn, do you have a question? Yeah, Lynn Harbaugh. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Good. <laughs> I'm in Calgary. Thank you. Thanks oh, for good. your insights tonight. A um, couple of things. Um, I'm finding I have a leg injury. So when I go out, I purposely go out so that I can sense nature, but I'm so distracted by the pain in my leg. Yeah. And so I, it's sort of this mixed blessing. But um, I guess what I wanted to say was I'm always finding lessons in nature. So there's this place that I go down by the river <laughs> and I'm leaning over the bridge and it looks like these big rocks on this little sand thing in the middle and come to find out they're ducks and there's there's six baby ducks and the mom gets in the water and they all follow and she doesn't even look at them and they just I thought my god how does this work and then she comes back and only four come back and then another one comes back and then she takes off to get the other one and I mean, I mean all I could think was I guess whatever that new Broadway play is you will be found. Well, that's very sweet. I could, would Lynn, if I could just say this to you and ask you, I mean, the pain in your body is nature. Oh, shit. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> I know. And I don't mean that in a glib way. I just, I, it's, it, it, yeah, it's to, we, you know, that's nature, right? Um, blood and bones, you know, like you look at the water, the river where the ducks are, right? And your body is a slow river. It's like 70% water. It's right. It's of the same nature. And um, this can be initially just sort of conceptual, but it's, it's, you know, we are in nature, including through the pains of our fragile, you know, natural body. That's another aspect of it. When I see people occasionally walking a dog that's missing a leg, and well, they carry on with such, oh. That's Tom. Tom, you need to mute yourself, I think. That's OK. Yeah, you keep going, Lynn. And then I'll move on to Julie, so. Yes, yes. They, they carry on with such bravery and tenacity. Yeah. And I find that just remarkable. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, I got kind of banged up a little bit because uh, I don't have the, <laughs> the skills I, I, I used to have as a rock climber. And, you know, the blood on my skin, not a lot, but a little. That's nature. It's nature moving through. You know, these are just different ways to come into that this relational intimacy. And, uh, you know, in it, to me, it's very centered around Buddhist teachings of really, as I said during the kind of casual beginnings before we formally began, that um, when we live in harmony with the two facts of existence, of you know relationality and change, when we live in harmony with that, we do so much better. Oh, I'll say something really fast. I'm a singer, and harmony is my thing. 
So that just makes total sense. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. <laughs> All right. That's great. Okay. Now I'm going to harmonize with Julie Arnheim. So Julie, asking you to unmute. Great. You have to unmute yourself. Great. You are. I, I was getting the mouse to work. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Rick. I have been struggling. Even the first part of this, I was struggling with meditating and being stable. I was the one who had asked that question. Yeah. And when you came into the conversation about the neighbors, it really hit home to me in many ways. And now as you, there's, I'm trying to remember where my question part was, but one of the things that you touched on that I've been doing is paying attention to specific plants, mm. watching that individual plant grow and change. Yeah. And how sometimes a plant that doesn't look like it's got much left in it, all of a sudden will create a new shoot or a new branch or a new berry where you didn't think that it was possible. And I've watched this happen in the biblical garden that my synagogue has mm. with an olive tree that lasted outside in Pittsburgh. And it did not look like it was going to make it. Yeah. And it is flourishing now. Oh. And a frankincense that's doing that and a tamarisk tree. Yeah. And it's just amazing when, because I'm in the garden so frequently that I can see these changes. And I guess what I'm, aware of from this talk and your vulnerability hmm. authentic conversation tonight is that I'm not paying attention to my changes. That's really interesting. You're right. The ways in which you are nature and in, in your changes. Yes. That's very deep there, Julie. Yeah. Wait to watch this again because I won't remember it in two minutes. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, no, that's yes. Our own changes. Yeah. I mean and yeah, go on. I sent I sent you individually, but I sent in the group mm -hmm. a talk that was done for part of our biblical garden, but it's non, it's a non-religious talk. It's about the neuroscience of nature. Mm. So that's great. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely look at it. I think I, I spotted it in passing. Well, thank you, Julie. You know, you're and, welcome. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you everyone for oh, being thank you. my awakening tonight. So we will finish close to, we are already at half past the hour, but I'm going to very Quickly, if it's okay with both Leslie and Rachel, finish up with you. Okay? All right, great. So I'm asking Leslie to unmute. Great. Hi. I just wanted to let you know, my, my daughter, who is this amazing pediatric social worker that works at a local hospital, had a severe traumatic brain injury at 18. Mm. And rock climbing and being in nature is what has truly changed her life she was paralyzed on the right side wow. i mean her recovery is whole complete amazing yeah she's training to climb rainier again uh. which terrifies me you know i'd rather duck <laughs> under the couch <laughs> but that she grew up in the country and yeah. we live in the mountains and my favorite saying is if you are lucky enough to live in the mountains you are lucky enough <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. That's great. Well, I'm really glad to hear that for your sake and for hers. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it truly <laughs> feeds you. Yeah. To have that time in nature, whatever that looks like. You know, for some of us, I mean, I get the phone call in the morning, there's a mountain lion at the bottom of your driveway, just so you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a different world, but um, that's right. <laughs> its that's own right. adventures. So I'm glad you got to go out 
and really oh, yeah, in nature. Cooking, cooking is a kind of participation in nature potentially as we feel the vegetables, we peel the carrots, we chop them, we break them into parts, we take them into ourselves. Eventually we pass them along in one way or another, you know, like that too. It's a way to be in it. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. And uh, then finishing with Rachel, yeah, asking you to unmute. Great. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much. Um, I totally related to so many things that you said. So thank you. Um, I had a tragedy in my family. My brother passed away and I had hmm. joined, this is seven years ago, and I joined this farm group, you know, so I had a farm mentor and he was huh. going to kind of teach me how to be a farmer. And every time I would see him, I would just be bawling my brains out. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do anymore. And he told me, he says, go down into your garden, sit there with your feet in the dirt every single day and just watch your garden day after day after day. And Beautiful. I watched every little leaf grow, everything happen. And I tell you, it was just so healing. And I go down there now every night, cut all my greens, get all my stuff for dinner. And it's the same very spiritual feeling by doing that. So, Thank you for sharing that. And I'm feeling the giftedness, the ways that we're gifted. One of the, I'm reading a chapter a day, roughly, of they're quite short and accessible daily in this braiding sweetgrass. And just recently, the chapter I read was about gift economies, which are so different from the in capitalist, you know, everything has a price tag economies. You know, gifts flow through us. We share them as they flow through us. Capitalism tends to be linear and stopped. Um, anyway. Yeah. Well, well, this man had been a corporate something or other, a big guy, yeah. and he became this farmer and passed, you know, passing this calm, gentle, loving energy throughout the community. And it just happened to come my way. And so I'm always grateful for him teaching me how to deal with that tragedy in a different yeah. way than he probably would have. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Rachel, for sharing that. I'm, I'm glad to hear what you're telling us here.